in the forest you'll find a fabulous banquet, a fairy wall. If you close your eyes and you open your mind, the veil disappears and you'll see it all. Hi my angels, it's Haley Reese and oh goodness, I have been wanting to make this video probably for a few weeks now, but <laughs> I knew that if I was going to cover this specific case with so many twists and turns and details, I would really need to have all of my ducks in a row, make sure I have all of the facts laid out, and that took a lot longer than I anticipated. There are so many things to talk about with the case of Kathleen Peterson and Michael Peterson, and there are so many different theories to explore, so I hope that you guys are really excited for today's video. It's probably going to be a super long one, so sit back, relax, maybe drink a cup of coffee, a cup of hot cocoa, something, and let's just dive right on into this case because like I said, there are so many details and I don't want to leave a single one out. So just recently I watched the Netflix documentary The Staircase, which revolves around the death of Kathleen Peterson in 2001. Now Kathleen Peterson's husband, Michael Peterson, would wind up charged for the murder of his wife though he would claim for the years and years and years and years to come that he was completely innocent. So many crazy things happen. He winds up freed from prison. There's a lot of details revolving around it, but needless to say, by the end of this documentary, it's 13 episodes, by the way, all like 45 minutes to an hour each. And by the end of this 13 episode documentary, I was left truly wondering what on earth happened because there were so many times throughout the documentary where I had this gut feeling or this intuition where I was leaning towards that he really did it. But then there were other moments where he would seem so sincere where I would start to think maybe he did it. So naturally, after leaving that specific documentary on Netflix, I wanted to conduct a little bit of my own research into this specific case because I wanted to make sure that the Netflix documentary wasn't biased. After doing my own research, it was very clear to me that the staircase was very weighted towards Michael Peterson and his attorney's perspective of the trial, rather than completely neutral and leaving it up to the viewer to decide after listening to both parties. And when I started to do my own research and watch different documentaries and different and read a bunch of different articles and a bunch of different backstories behind things, I realized that there were so many key and important details left out of the staircase on Netflix. So what I did is I gathered the information from both the staircase and information from both alternative resources and I decided to kind of combine them both into this video telling you the different ways that he accounts things in the staircase versus the way that other people heard it or saw it back when the trial was beginning and then kind of leave it up to you guys by the end of this to see what you guys think. I'm not leaning towards either way while I'm talking about this case. I really want you guys to be able to form your own opinions because it's so difficult with this case to know which way to lean. So let's get into the history of both Michael and Kathleen Peterson. So Michael and Kathleen Peterson met in 1986 and Michael had two sons, Clayton and Todd, from a prior marriage. He also had two adoptive daughters, Martha and Margaret, who were the daughters of Elizabeth Ratliff, who had passed away and granted custody to Michael Peterson. Now Elizabeth Ratliff had passed away in Germany, which is where Michael and his previous marriage, or his previous wife, sorry, were residing at the time before moving to the United States and meeting Kathleen Peterson. Now Kathleen also had a daughter named Caitlin from her prior marriage, so all together between Kathleen and Michael, they had five children. Now the two met and they instantly fell in love. Fascinatingly enough, the one thing that coincides throughout every single documentary that I have watched on this specific case is how in love these two appear. They seem to have it all. They were both super smart. They had built these amazing lives for themselves. And the two would marry in 1997 in the foyer of their 14 room mansion. Now Michael Peterson was a war veteran who claimed to have attained an injury while serving in Vietnam and he used his war experiences to become a best-selling author writing about his specific experiences. He also worked as a newspaper columnist for the Durham Herald Sun where he voiced some extremely opinionated thoughts on law enforcement and basically anybody or anything that had authority in Durham. He spoke pretty negatively which kind of plays into a couple of people's theories with this specific case. 
Kathleen was a member of the Durham Arts Council. She was an extraordinary mother of five who threw these extravagant cocktail parties and these massive dinners of like 50 plus people. And she also had a really great job as the senior executive at Nortel Network. These two were really the epitome of seeming like they had it all from the outside and really a great case to look at whenever you think that somebody's life is so perfect from the outside because on December 9th, 2001, a long downhill, terrible battle would begin when Michael finds Kathleen Peterson dead at the bottom of a staircase in their home. On December 9th, 2001 at 2.40 a.m., a frantic Michael Peterson calls 911 claiming that his wife Kathleen Peterson had had an accident. I will insert the 911 call here. Really listen to the 911 call. Really vibe out the 911 call and see if you feel that it's really authentic. There are people who have analyzed this 911 call and feel as though it's really staged and far too many details and just he's not really answering the questions. But I also believe, in my personal opinion, that you can never judge how somebody would react to finding their loved one in a massive pool of blood at the bottom of a staircase. So take a listen to the 911 call and let me know what you guys think of it. Durham 911, where's your emergency? Oh, 1810 Cedar Street, please. What's wrong? My wife had an accident. She's still breathing. What kind of accident? She's still on the stairs. She's still breathing. Please come. Is she conscious? What? Is she no. conscious? No, she's not conscious. Okay. Please. How many stairs did you what? fall down? Huh? How many the stairs? Stairs. How many stairs? Oh. Calm down, sir. Uh, Calm down. No, 1520. Uh, I don't know. Please, get somebody here right away. Please. Okay, somebody's right dispatching the ambulance no. while I ask you questions. It's it, it's off of a, it's a force field, okay? Please, please. Now, here's where the first and most shocking conflicting information between the staircase and other resources and other documentaries began for me. And that is, if you've watched The Staircase on Netflix, you know that when Michael Peterson recounts that evening that would ultimately lead to the death of Kathleen Peterson, he claimed that the two of them had shared several, if not two bottles of wine, and that they had been just having a really great night, that they loved to talk to one another. So they were talking away, they made their way out to the pool, which is one of the most beautiful areas in their home. They sat down, they conversated for a while, and Kathleen had a conference call in the morning, so she had decided that she was actually gonna go in earlier. Well, Michael claimed that he had decided to stay by the pool and enjoy it a little bit longer and when he finally went in to go to bed that was when he was met with the horrific scene of Kathleen Peterson at the bottom of the stairs in a pool of her own blood. However, in other documentaries that I've been researching and other articles and things like that, it's said that he actually told the paramedics that the two of them had shared a little bit of champagne, that they decided they were going to go to bed, that he headed out to turn the lights off by the pool and when he came in Kathleen Peterson was down on the ground covered in her own blood. When the police arrived, one of the things that you'll hear frequently throughout this case is that the amount of blood for falling down the stairs was astonishing. The blood was splattered super high up the walls, I believe even on the roof. It was all around her. She was just covered in her own blood, including on the bottoms of her feet. Now, something else that I don't believe was mentioned in the staircase is that they not only found blood surrounding Kathleen, but they found blood on the couch they found blood that looked or appeared to be smeared or wiped on the front door. That kind of leads you to believe that it wasn't just a falling down the stairs incident, but I don't believe that that was mentioned. And they found on the back of Kathleen Peterson's leg, when I should note she was laying on her back, when they discovered her was Michael Peterson's footprint. Law enforcement also noted that in the kitchen, the sink smelled as though alcohol had just been poured down it. It kind of looked like these two champagne glasses were staged and only one of them had like smeared fingerprints around it and the other one was seemingly clean as though somebody had just grabbed it by the stem and placed it rather than held it and been drinking it. Now Michael Peterson's son Todd arrived to the scene just shortly after the paramedics and police did which a lot of people found to be super odd considering it was 2.40 in the morning but he claimed that initially when he saw all the paramedics there, he thought that his dad, notably older than Kathleen, had suffered a heart attack or something. He never expected to find the scene that he did when he went into the home. So while the police are conducting this investigation and really analyzing the scene where Kathleen Peterson was found, they escorted Michael Peterson to the opposite side of the home to his study. 
Now, I watched a couple of different interviews with the law enforcement that had escorted him to the opposite side, and they've even said, it's really impossible to analyze how somebody is going to react in a moment like this. But one thing that they noted that they found super odd was that even at times, he was on his computer, like, doing Lord knows what, when they had just found his wife dead at the bottom of a staircase, which isn't necessarily normal behavior, but like we said, there's no way to really analyze how somebody would react. How I react to a crisis could be completely opposite to how you react to a crisis. In fact, it probably would be. But I just wanted to add that detail in as well. So right off the bat, both Todd and Mike kind of went off of this theory that Kathleen Peterson had drank way too much that night and that was the result of her falling down the stairs. However, at 11 p.m., Kathleen Peterson had went into Michael's study and called a co-worker who claimed to law enforcement that she sounded neither intoxicated nor upset around this time. Where I would kind of debunk that piece of evidence is that Michael Peterson had called at 2.40 a.m., having found her at the bottom of the stairs. I know from experience, if you drink too much too quick, you could get drunk in the matter of minutes if you really wanted to. So the time span between 11 p.m. And 2.40 a.m. when Michael had called 911 is a pretty big gap where she could have gotten intoxicated. However, her blood alcohol levels were tested and she was below the legal limit. I believe she was 0.07 and 0.08 and above is considered legally intoxicated. So her levels weren't of somebody who was wasted. Dr. Deborah Radish, a forensic pathologist at the state medical examiner's office was the one who conducted the autopsy. Now what she discovered was the seven deep lacerations at the back of Kathleen Peterson's head were inconsistent with that of a fall. However, she didn't have any skull damage or any brain damage. They were just these deep lacerations and she concluded that this was the results of a homicide and declared that she was murdered it was not accidental. On December 20th, 2001, Michael Peterson was indicted for the murder of Kathleen Peterson and turned himself in at the Durham County Jail. He claimed that he was completely innocent and that all of these charges would be revoked in court, that he would prove his innocence. And he also went ahead and hired a big time defense lawyer, David Rudolph, who was in court. Incredible. Like when I was watching this specific case pan out in the staircase, I really took a liking to David Rudolph. He was very blunt with his things. He even said he's not here to prove whether or not Michael Peterson actually did this. He is here to prove that there is not enough evidence to support that he did it and the court system is supposed to abide by innocent until proven guilty. So he was just incredible and one of the greatest things that Michael Peterson could have, or one of the greatest individuals he could have put on his case. Now Michael Peterson served a month in prison after having turned himself in before a judge would actually allow him to post bond. Now this is one of the strangest parts I think of this entire case and that is when information surfaced that Elizabeth Ratliff, the mother of Michael Peterson's two adoptive daughters, had also been found dead at the bottom of the stairs and that Michael Peterson was the last to see her alive. Now at the time of her death, it was stated that she had suffered a brain hemorrhage and that she'd fallen down the stairs and died and it was declared completely accidental. But when the news went to the authorities of this strange coincidence, they couldn't help but notice the shocking similarities. I mean, even the crime scene, the way that the blood was splattered completely up the walls and all of that just seems so odd. So on April of 2003, they headed to Texas to exhume her body. Now this raised a lot of controversy. A lot of people felt that the body of Elizabeth Ratliff had nothing to do with the case of Kathleen Peterson and why disrupt the resting of somebody who's passed and bring forth another parent that these two young girls have just lost because both of these girls felt that Kathleen Peterson and Michael Peterson were their parents. They even called Kathleen Peterson mom. So now they're bringing up and digging up their birth mother, which is just so traumatic to the family. So there was a lot of controversy. However, when they conducted the autopsy on the body of Elizabeth Ratliff, it got even more eerily similar. She too had seven deep lacerations on the back of her head, like Kathleen Peterson. And at the end of the autopsy, it was deemed that her death too had been a homicide. 
Now, Martha and Margaret, ironically, which are the daughters of Elizabeth Ratliff, who were adopted by Michael Peterson and felt that Kathleen Peterson was their mother, stood by Michael Peterson loyally throughout this entire trial, throughout this entire case, as did Clayton and Todd. However, although Kathleen Peterson's daughter, Caitlin, stood by him in the beginning, after the autopsy results were posted and after everything came forth as far as the details of her mother's injuries, Caitlin turned on Michael Peterson and believed that he had in fact murdered her mother. Now information began surfacing that the entire life of Michael Peterson had been a lie. For one, he had never suffered a war injury or a combat injury while out in Vietnam. In fact, he had suffered an injury in a car accident well on a security detail. He also never received a Purple Heart from the war, which he had claimed as well. Then it became clear that both Kathleen and Michael were in severe financial debt. $142,728 to be exact. They were living month to month off of credit cards and Kathleen Peterson's sister Candace testified that in mid-2001, Kathleen had told her she worried about losing her job and complained about the tight finances, claiming that they were unable to even fix their leaky plumbing and other issues going on within the home. On November 29th, 2001, Michael Peterson had wrote his ex-wife Patricia, who was a school teacher in Germany, urging her to take out a $30,000 home equity loan in order to pay off the credit card debt incurred by their two sons, Clayton and Todd. Clayton and Todd owed $1,000 a month in interest alone. And Michael Peterson concluded this message by saying, it is simply not possible for me to discuss this with Kathleen. Now, when all of this information as far as their financial standings surfaced, suddenly people felt as though they had a motive. Kathleen Peterson's death would give Michael Peterson from her life insurance policy $1,834,166 so people suddenly thought that perhaps he had killed Kathleen in hopes of getting that money and being able to live stable. Now, upon Michael Peterson's computer hard drive being analyzed, they discovered thousands upon thousands of gay porn and gay porn images, and they even found emails exchanged between Michael Peterson and a male escort talking about some, some things that you wouldn't expect somebody in a happy marriage with his soulmate to be doing. Now this raised another motive. Many people speculated that perhaps Kathleen Peterson had found out about this side of him and was really hurt and betrayed by it and to keep this a secret, he decided to kill her. It's difficult to say and I don't feel it's my place to speculate based off of somebody's sex life or somebody's marriage or things like that. However, it is a little strange for him to say that she was the love of his life, his world, that he loved her more than anything, they had a perfect marriage, and to be playing that only to find out that he was trying to receive services from a male escort on the side. But we're gonna leave that at that. It's just a very important detail in the trial that I had to include here. So on July 1st, 2003, the trial began. The biggest argument in the case being built against Michael Peterson was the blood spatter. Blood spatter expert Dwayne Deaver claimed that in his expertise, the blood splatter represented that of somebody who had in fact murdered somebody and had tried to cover it up. He claimed that the blood splatter found on the inner portion of Michael Peterson's shorts could only have been replicated or created if he had been over top of Kathleen as she were being beaten. And he did a bunch of different experiments trying to prove that that's how the blood splatter would wind up on the inside of his pants. Michael Peterson's team, however, claimed that an impaired Kathleen had fallen backwards down the stairs multiple times and they had like a demo video. They never claimed that it was exactly how she fell, but they did claim that if she had fallen this specific way, the seven lacerations on the back of her head would have been attained from that. David Rudolph called in crime scene expert Dr. Henry Lee, who claimed that the blood splatter was very inconsistent of that of a homicide and that it was too much and went too many directions at once for it to have been a murder. So there was two parties saying completely different things about the blood splatter on the walls. Then a supposed murder weapon surfaced. All along while accusing somebody of murder, the key thing that you want to find in order to prove your case is the murder weapon. And they knew that this murder weapon would have to be stiff enough to cause harm, 
but not heavy enough to cause a skull fracture because Kathleen had no skull fractures, but she did have seven deep lacerations on the back of her head. Kathleen's sister had gifted Kathleen a fire poke or a fireplace poke that they claimed was missing from the house. District attorney Jim Harden built an entire case surrounding this fireplace poke as the murder weapon. However, David Rudolph shocked everybody when in the remaining days of trial, the missing fireplace poke resurfaced and they claimed that it had been in his garage this entire time. It was not covered in blood. In fact, it was covered in spiderwebs and dust and all of that jazz. But the district attorney couldn't fathom how they had scavenged this house high to low and didn't find it. So that was really suspicious to them, but the murder weapon surfaced. When it came time for the verdict, the 12 members of the jury found Michael Peterson guilty in the murder of Kathleen Peterson. Michael Peterson was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Even while in prison, Michael Peterson and David Rudolph kept on fighting for his innocence. Then in 2011, something shocking for this specific case and another case as well happened. There was finally a break in the case of Michael Peterson due to another case entirely. Michael Peterson had exhausted all of his chances for appeal until it was discovered that on another case, Dwayne Deaver, who was the blood splatter expert from Michael Peterson's case, had failed to report blood test results that would have been helpful to the defendant, Greg Taylor. Greg Taylor had served 19 years in prison, but due to these facts of Dwayne Deaver that surfaced, his conviction had been thrown out as a result. However, because Dwayne Deaver was the blood splatter expert from the case of Michael Peterson, it was determined that Michael Peterson deserved a retrial. Now, Dwayne Deaver's misleading testimony actually formed a key part of the prosecution's case against Michael Peterson because it was the blood splatter at the scene of Kathleen's death that initially even made them question her death as a murder rather than a tragic accident. Now, Michael Peterson was offered an Alfred plea rather than putting his family through an entire new trial that could end in the exact same results. On February 24th, 2017, Michael Peterson entered the Alfred plea to voluntary manslaughter of Kathleen Peterson. The judge sentenced him to a maximum of 86 months served in prison with credit for the time previously served. Because he had already served more time than the sentence, he'd served like 98.5 months in prison, he did not face additional prison time. Now, during this part of the staircase was when I kind of started to believe that maybe he hadn't done it because he kept telling his defense attorney that he was definitely not going to admit to murdering Kathleen because he had not. He would enter the Alfred plea, but he would not say that he was guilty. He would not verbalize those words because he was not. And throughout this entire trial and this entire span, he never once admitted to killing Kathleen Peterson. Never once, he never even insinuated. Now, one thing that I do have to add though is that it came up and surfaced that Michael Peterson had had a romantic relationship and romance with the Netflix documentary, The Staircase's editor. So people believe that's why it leaned more towards making Michael Peterson look innocent rather than a neutral approach to this specific trial and this specific case. Now, there was one more theory about the death of Kathleen Peterson that a lot of people actually stood behind and that was that her injuries had been attained by an owl. This was because in the evidence, an owl feather was actually listed. People started to theorize that perhaps Kathleen Peterson had been attacked by an owl outside, fallen after rushing inside, been knocked unconscious after hitting her head on the stair. It said that the SBI crime lab report listed a microscopic owl feather and a wooden sliver from a tree limb entangled in a clump of hair that had been pulled out by the roots found clutched in Kathleen's left hand. A re-examination of the hair in September 2008 found two more microscopic owl feathers. People say that this theory actually supports itself within evidence because the scalp wounds were trilobed and consisted with markings left by owls. The feathers were actually similar to those on owl feet. Cedar needles were found in her hands and body claiming that perhaps she had fallen over after being attacked by the owl outside. It would explain her blood being splattered up the staircase rather than 
been down. Her footprints being in her own blood kind of indicated that she had been injured before falling down or had already been bleeding before reaching the bottom of the stairs. It would also make sense, they say, why there was blood smeared on the door as though she had opened it trying to come in. Advocates of this specific theory actually argued as well, saying that owl attacks on people are super common in that specific area, and one person who had been attacked by an owl claimed it was like being hit in the back of the head with a baseball bat. So then there was this whole owl theory as well. This case is probably one of the most confusing cases I've ever took a look at, I've ever listened to things on. I've literally spent hours watching documentary after documentary and reading article after article, and even still, I don't know what to think of this specific case. So I guess that's where I'm turning to you guys. I know this was a long video. If you have made it this far and you listened to every detail that I've shared with you, what do you guys think of this case? Do you think Michael Peterson was in fact innocent? Do you think that he was guilty? Do you think that he was a manipulative individual who was able to paint an image that he wanted people to see? Some people think that Todd had something to do with it, hence why he showed up to the scene just moments after paramedics. There are so many theories, including that owl theory, that I just don't know what to think. So I knew I had to make a video on this. I knew we had to dive into it. And so please drop your comments down below and let me know what you guys think of this case because I will be reading through all of your comments because I literally have no idea whether or not I think he's innocent or guilty. Well, you guys, that is it for today's video. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed looking through this case and trying to analyze all of the evidence versus the theories and trying to figure out what truly occurred. I still don't know, but if there are any more cases like this one specifically that you guys want me to dive into and cover, also comment that down below because I really enjoyed researching this case and I would love to continue to do things like this in the future. If you guys are new to my channel or you are just not yet subscribed but you do enjoy my videos, make sure you go ahead and click that subscribe button. I post a ton of videos so I don't want you to miss when I upload and please give this video a big thumbs up. If you did enjoy it, it makes my heart super, super happy when you guys do that, so please do that. Remember my loves, do all things with kindness and until next time, I love you.